<coughs> so I'm continuing on. I've done a little, a little mini-series on the healthy living. If you remember, I, I started off, I did a healthy living on diet and what we should be eating and the things that, that are good for our body. And then last week, I did one on our health and how we ought to be treating that with preventing disease and you know vaccinations and other things that we take in and, and how we ought to be treating our body in order to maintain a healthy body and you know going to the doctor and those types of things. So tonight, I'm going to continue on with the subject now of child birthing and child rearing okay these both have to do with with healthy living and and raising your children and giving birth to children and I want to start off because you know we get inundated with all this false wisdom the wisdom of the world which is which is nonsense and which is garbage and these days we have a philosophy of family planning and normally, what you'll, when they talk about family planning, usually it's referring to the use of contraception to prevent having children, right? Now, it should go without saying that the family planning should always be a result of a married couple, right? The Bible says that fornication is wickedness and that you, you are not supposed to have a, a relation with the opposite gender until you get married. That is God's plan, and that is going to be the plan to happiness. You don't want to be having relationships outside of marriage. Wait, kids, until you get married before you start to have a family and before you commit an act that is only designed to be with your husband or with your wife. But today we have people that, that talk about this family planning and they, they push contraception and they'll say, you know, you need to limit how many children you could have because it's irresponsible, you know, for you to have more children if you can't afford it and everything else. They'll try to give you all kinds of reasons not to have children. But let's look at what the Bible says. We read Psalm 127. Let's look at it again starting in verse number three. Actually, verse number one. The Bible says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. God is going to build your house. God is the one that opens up the womb, and God is the one that closes the womb. We just finished up a Bible study going through the book of Genesis. You can start reading through. Read on your own the book of Genesis. Where it's, it's January. You know, a lot of people have a, a New Year's resolution to read the Bible in a year. This is, this is the month where the most people are reading through Genesis than any other time of year. You have a lot of people starting off the year saying, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to get my Bible out and read it. And they get started. And they start in Genesis chapter 1. And we'll see how long that lasts. Hopefully it lasts, you know, Lord willing, it's going to last a whole year for people. I really hope it does. But in Genesis, you're going to see a lot of stories. You see the story of Abraham and Sarah and how God had promised Abraham was going to have a multitude of, of seed, of people that, that were going to come out of his loins, of, of nations. And God was going to bless him extremely. And Abraham was like 100 years old and it's still like no child, you know. I mean, you live all this stuff. But it's because God is in control. God is in charge. We saw that with Isaac and Rebekah. Same thing. They prayed for 20 years to have a child. And Abraham, remember, he had Isaac was his son. Now, he had a few other children that were illegitimate children through other people other than Sarah. But Abraham and Sarah had one child. Isaac and Rebekah had twins, right? They had Jacob and Esau. Those were their children. And that's all they had. And God, and God opened up the womb and gave them two children. But then what about Jacob? Right Now, Jacob had a few wives, which was wrong, but we see, especially in the story of Jacob, how God was opening up Leah's womb and he was closing Rachel's womb because Rachel was the one that was loved and Leah was the one that was hated and God didn't like that and Leah was the legit, even though Jacob was deceived, Leah was the legitimate wife because he's the one that, she, that he married first. She, he married her first and he should have just stuck with her even though he was deceived. But, of course, that's not what happened. But God was opening Leah's womb and giving her children. Why? Because it's a blessing. Look at verse number 3 here of Psalm 127. The Bible says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. God says, when you have a child... That's a reward from God. That's a very good thing. But these days, you know, the world's going to tell you, oh, children are nothing but a pain. They're just a burden. They're just a lot of work. They're just a lot of money. 
So you need to limit how many you have. No, if God's going to reward me, I'm going to want as big of a reward as possible. We should. We should have this attitude that children are a wonderful thing. Children are a great thing. Hey, praise the Lord. I praise God for the four children that he's given me. I am extremely happy for them, and I want to have as many children as possible. Look at verse number four. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The Bible is saying, look, you should be happy as a man if you have, he, he equates here children to being like arrows, right? He's saying, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, you know, a mighty man that knows how to use his bow and arrows, and he's able to shoot those arrows. He said, hey, so are children of the youth. And you're going to be happy if your quiver, the quiver is what holds the arrows, it's the little thing that holds all your arrows, if your quiver is full of them. Meaning, if you have a lot of children, that's going to make you, you, you should be happy for that. That's a good thing. It's a blessing from God to have children. Completely the opposite mentality today is being taught. So number one, family planning should be, let God decide how many children you're going to have. That's what I believe. I don't believe we should be interfering. If God's the one that opens up the womb and closes the womb, I don't think we should be interfering and meddling and going to the test tube, going to the laboratory, trying to create a baby or going to the bedroom and doing, so, you know, using some other products to prevent yourself from having children. I don't believe that. I think that we should let God, God knows, God's the one who gives us life. God's the one who gives us our children and he's given them unto us as a reward, as a blessing. And we should let him determine what the right amount of children is. Now, it doesn't mean that you're a, ba if God has only blessed you with maybe one child, like he did with Abraham, that doesn't mean, I mean, Abraham was a great man, but that's what God deemed fit to give unto Abraham. Just like Isaac and Rebecca. Hey, these are great people in the Bible, great examples, great Christians. Yet he only gave them two children. We need to learn and be happy with what God has given us. If God has given you one child, praise the Lord for that child. If God has given you two children, praise the Lord for those children. If God has given you 15 children, hey, praise God for those children. But we ought to leave the planning up to God. Let him decide. The Bible tells us and explains that, you know, I have been old and now I'm young and I have yet to see the righteous begging bread. If your concern about having children is that, how are we going to feed them? How are we going to support these children? Because is it true children are expensive? Yeah, it does. They, they cost money because you have to feed them and clothe them and, and take care of them. Of course it does. But it's not a mathematical equation. If God's the one that's going to give you the children... And you're doing it legitimately through your, your marriage, through having a relationship that is normal for a man and woman to have that are married. And, you, and it results in having children. Hey, God will, bless, God will make sure that you're fed and clothed and taken care of. God has promised to do that for you. And if God's going to give you another life, He's going to give you another child, we can trust God that He will allow us and help us to get through and to take care of those children. God is not going to put us in a situation where we are not able to, to deal with it or we're not able to take care of it. Isaiah, you don't have to turn there. Isaiah 44, 24 shows us that God's the one that creates life and he's the one that creates the babies. It says, the, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone that spreadeth ab abroad the earth by myself. It says he formed, he formed him in the womb. God is the one that forms and fashions the children. God is the giver of life. If God decides to, to give life to you, let's just assume that God knows what he's doing. Now, that being said, let's move on to the actual birth. Right? Remember the subject is healthy living. We're, we're looking at child birthing and also child rearing. So the first thing I would say in, in child birthing is let God do the family planning for you. Don't, don't rely on your own wisdom and worry about how you're going to take care of your children. Look, God's going to give you what you're able to handle. And we don't need to go to man's invention to try to, to, try to get around the way God designed things. 
The Bible says, let not the man defraud, the, the husband defraud the wife, or the wife to defraud the husband, that basically your body belongs to your spouse. And marriage was given to avoid fornication. And that it's totally normal to have this type of physical relationship with each other, and that you shouldn't be withholding, neither the, the man or the woman should be withholding that relationship from each other. The Bible says, except to be with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. Only for fasting and prayer is where you should be agreeing to withhold that from each other so that you could humble yourself before God. And, and I preach an entire sermon on fasting and why we do that. But that's it. And otherwise, the Bible says you should be having a normal relationship. And you know what? That's going to help you in a relationship anyways. There's a lot of people have marriage problems. If you could have a normal, regular, physical relationship with your spouse... It's gonna, it should come through that you're going to care, be more caring for each other and love each other um, anyways. But, um, so let's leave that to God. No, my next point, though, is that birth is not, childbirth is not a medical procedure. This isn't something that God designed to, uh, to, that you have to go to a hospital and you have to have, it's, it's you know, a doctor that's like, like it's a medical procedure because it's not. Now, before I even get into this too far, I want, I'm going to start off by saying, you know, the goal isn't to offend anyone. This is what I believe to be biblical truth and biblical principles into what I believe is best for you to do. There's some things that, that are indisputable. You know, I believe that God is the giver of life. I know that. And I don't think that we should be taking things in our own hand. But if you, whatever you decide to do, how, however you decide to have your children, you know, that's up to you. It's the same thing with the diet. Right, the previous sermon I preach, do what you want with your body. Hey, I'm trying to give you good advice. What I think to be is biblical principles and ways to, to help you. Take it or leave it. It's up to you. And I'm not gonna say, you know, I'm not gonna say that people, oh, if you go to the hospital and give birth in the hospital, it's a sin. I don't believe that for a second. Not for a second. Do what you want to do, but I'm here to tell you, I want to show you some things and just, just try to make some sense tonight that for one, birth is not a medical procedure. We go back to Genesis chapter 3, we're going to see God's design for the whole birth process to begin with. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the result of the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Both of them sinned and God put a curse upon both of them. Remember, Adam, for, you know, God caused the ground to be a lot harder to work. So that he said, Adam, because you've sinned, by the sweat of your face now, you're going to have to toil and work the land in order to bring forth food, in order to feed yourself. In the garden, everything was provided for them perfectly. Now you've got to work and you're going to work until the day that you die. That's the curse that came upon Adam. But let's look at Eve. It says in verse number 16 of Genesis 3, it says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So here we see the submissive role of the wife to the husband and her desiring him to lead over her. And not only that, but the 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 conception the childbearing is is going to be brought forth in sorrow why because it's a painful process <laughs> anyone who any woman who's had children knows that i know it's a painful process just from being with my wife while she's giving birth to our children it's not a fun thing you know a woman that's in travel a woman that's in labor you know she has to spend you know nine months walking around as the baby grows and grows and grows and gets bigger and gets harder to carry around and, uh, and adds more weight and things. And then at the end, when the woman has to push this baby out of her body, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a fun thing. But this is the way that God designed it, which is also why I don't believe that women should be taking drugs in order to remove the pain from the process. This is something that God has designed. And you know what? It goes, I don't want to say it goes beyond the Bible because the Bible should be enough evidence as it is. But there is plenty of evidence. If, you eat, if you're someone that really likes looking at science and, and other things, there's other reasons and there's other studies that have been done on mothers who have taken drugs and didn't experience the pain of childbirth versus those that have. And there tends to be a much bigger bond um, with the child after someone has not taken any drugs or anything to reduce that pain but has gone through it naturally. Um, it's just something that, that's part of the process. It's kind of like when, uh, when you go through a hard time with somebody individually, 
Uh, oftentimes, like when, when people go to war and they go through these extreme circumstances, you, you tend to build bonds with people through, through real difficult times, through times of pain, through times of, of, of extreme stress or trauma. You will end up building bonds and relationships with people through that process. And it's the same way when a, when a woman gives birth to a child. It's a, it's a big process. It's a process for the child and for the, for the mother. But um, when you go through that, there is going to be sorrow in bringing forth the children. But as soon as the baby's born, then there's great joy. Now, man is not as smart as he thinks he is. And this is a common theme through all the healthy living things. We should not be putting too much confidence in man. We should not be thinking that, oh, you know, these scientists are all just so smart and so brilliant and they know better. When, when you find something that's contradictory uh, between what man might say to be true or good and what the Bible says, hey, the Bible's always right. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number 5, as thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. God designed things that, that are so complicated that, that we don't even understand how they work, like how the, the bones grow in the womb. I mean, think about a child from, from those cells growing into a person and just becoming someone with flesh and blood and bones and, and organs and how everything just is created. We don't, we don't understand how that works. We can't understand that process. That's way too complicated for us to get. But we know that God has designed it that way and God is the one who created it that way. Now, the evolution philosophy will teach you that we need to improve on the birthing process. We need to improve on the things that God has made. And that's the way it is with, with everything that we've been going over, whether it be our health, whether it be the food that we... You know, man always thinks that he needs to improve on what God has done, and it always leads to problems. One of the improvements to giving birth is at least viewed by some people, not viewed by me, I don't think it's improvement at all, I think it's a back step, is the amount of now... Um, c-sections that are being done and it's it's like an epidemic in this country especially i looked up the statistics uh on the on the center for disease control right a cdc website not some crazy website not even not some pro-life website not some pro-natural birth website not some pro-home birth website the cdc their stats say that the number of, you know, call them vaginal or regular deliveries, natural deliveries, is 2,642,000. And the number of cesarean deliveries was 1,284,000. If you didn't catch that, that percent is 32%. Over 32.7% of all deliveries is by C-section. That means one in three. One out of three children being born is they're operating on. They're performing a medical procedure. They're going under the knife and cutting out that baby out of the body to be delivered. Now, I am not going to stand up here and say that there is never a time that that should ever be done. I don't believe that there is a time and a place for an extreme situation that gets out of hand, that, that's, that's not normal, or things don't happen right, where there is complications, where there are problems, where other things happen, where that is probably going to be the best option to have in order to maintain the safety of the child and of the mother. But that is not, should not be one in three. That would be a, if, this, if these were all necessary, that means God is seriously flawed in the process that he's given for women to have children. That you just need to cut open a child and perform surgery in order for a child to be born into this world safely. That is ridiculous. But there's lots of reasons people choose to do it. These days people are, are choosing to do that because of convenience. Whether it be the doctor's schedule or, or the, the, the woman's schedule, I need to get back to work at this date, so let's just plan to have this baby right here, and I'm going to do it when I want to do it. And this is the attitude that people have of just saying, I want to do things my way. I don't want to wait on the Lord. I don't want to wait on God who's given me this child. I'm going to take matters into my own hands and do them my way. Now, there's plenty of reasons uh, I mentioned before about having a hospital birth. We actually had a hospital birth with our first child. 
and uh, we were planning a home birth, but there were other issues and complications and things that came up, and I think that there's completely reasonable to go and do this. And, and again, you know, if you decide to have all of your children in a hospital, go ahead and do it. But here are some reasons that I have found that I don't think it's the best option to make for the health, for your family. One is that God designed this to be a natural process. This is not a medical procedure that needs to be done. Eve had children with Adam there, right? She was able to get through that and the children came out just fine. People all throughout history have been having babies and it has not been a requirement to go to a hospital to make sure that you, that you have somebody there to be able to perform surgery, you know, even just in case. But there's other reasons why I don't believe that the hospital is the appropriate place to have children. You think about a hospital is a place where people go when they have disease, when they're sick, when they're ill. It's a place that, that is full of germs and disease. I don't want my child who's just coming into this world to be in a place that, that has, as much as they try to keep it clean, hey, there's, there is plenty of sick people at the hospital. That's not the place that I would think is going to be the best place to have a child. Also, you consider the, the rates the, at which doctors these days will perform a C-section that will, you know, because once you go to the hospital, there's, there's certain freedoms you kind of lose. And there's, that you kind of get into a realm there where, where you're, you get more under their control and there's a lot of pressure to do things the way that they want you to do them. And oftentimes, parents aren't very aware of their own rights. They're not necessarily aware of... of medical knowledge and these types of things and it's easy to get pressured into doing things that you're unsure of or that you don't know much about into just doing things because you're being told that you should be doing them. There's a lot of treatments that they want you to give to your child with antibiotics and, and you know, being put under a sun lamp and being put like all these different things that they're going to want you to do and pressure you into doing and even lie to you about if they have to. I remember being told that if, what was it, if we, um, with, the, with the hospital birth, we did it, we were done, and I wanted to go home. And they wanted to keep Elizabeth there for my, her APGAR score was 9 out of 9. I mean, she was, she was deemed completely healthy. Nothing wrong with her. She had slight jaundice. Very slight. And they wanted to keep her and put her under the lamp and stuff. I was like, well, no, we'll just take her and bring her outside. She'll be fine. And what they tried to tell my wife, I, I had to go home, we did the whole thing, I went home to take care of our, our animals and come back and just and, and make the whole move back home. And the, the hospital was saying that, um, okay, well they said, well if you refuse what we're recommending, if you don't stay in the hospital, if you don't keep her in the hospital with you, then your insurance isn't going to pay for, for the birth process. And that was a lie. I had to call up, because we had a midwife at the time, I had to call up and find out. But see, these are the things. You get put into situations, and people could lie to you. And you don't necessarily know. If you don't have all of your facts, and you don't know everything going into this, it's easy to be manipulated. And that's just one, and that's a personal example. You know, I'm not saying that happens everywhere all the time. But this is something that we went through. But there definitely is a different mentality within the hospital. One of the reasons why is they need to cover their own um, lawsuits. There is a fear of people now because there's been so many frivolous lawsuits brought forth against doctors that they have to ch basically change their protocols. And this kind of goes, it's not just for childbirth, it's for everything. They will end up giving you way more of, of treatments or, or go through procedures that really aren't necessary, but the only reason they're doing them is to try to cover themselves that just in case they've missed something, they're just going to go ahead and do it anyways. We're just going to go ahead and do it, just like the C-section. Well, there might be some minor possible complication here. Well, we're just going to put it under a knife and just make sure everything comes out okay. We're just going to take matters in our own hands. We're not going to leave anything to chance whatsoever. Another reason why I don't uh, agree with going into the hospital is that the staff there, you don't really have control over who's going to be in the room and who's going to be helping or even sometimes performing the, you know, delivering the child. And I firmly believe this. I don't think it's right for women to be going to male uh, OBGYN doctors. I don't think it's right to be exposing your nakedness to someone of the opposite gender who is not your spouse.
I don't believe that to be true. I think there's something wrong with men who get into a field where they're looking at the private parts of a female all day long. You can say it's because they love children and they want to have babies. I don't think that's right. And I won't allow my wife to go to another man to, to open up before and have him be checking her out and looking at her. And I don't think that's right. But in a hospital, you don't always have that option. If there's a woman there, great, but you don't always have that choice. Now, thankfully, with our situation, we did have that choice. We were able to get a female there, but this is just one of the other things that happened. And, and look, you could call me crazy. You could say, I don't agree with that. Fine. I'm just trying to give you some of the reasons why I don't believe going to a hospital is the best choice. Now, if you have a problem, if there's, if there's high risks, if you're someone who's diabetic or you have other, other factors that, that, will, that will increase the risk of the child not being born safely and normally and naturally, you know, do what you think is best. Take the road that you think is going to provide the, the best way for your child to be born. But under normal circumstances, normal healthy person having a child, God didn't intend it to be some big medical procedure. Now, just because God didn't intend it to be that way, I do think it is important to have somebody else there with experience. For example, a midwife. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter number 1. The Bible refers to women that are midwives. Women whose job was to help in the birthing process. Help other women. Women normally that had their own children have gone through this now can help and give knowledge unto other people. While it is normal and natural, there are still things that you need to be aware of and to be able to look for when you have a child. There still is risk. There still is danger. And there, you know, someone ought to be monitoring and keeping track of the, the child and the mother because things can come up. And, and someone that has experience and that is knowledgeable in the health of a woman and in the, in the, the course of childbirth is very useful to have. Now look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. The Bible reads, and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other, Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, why have ye done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty, and it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river. And every daughter you shall save alive. What a wicked thing that Pharaoh did. And you know, this is the government at that time. This is Pharaoh saying, okay, midwives, this is what you're going to do. He's basically, you're going to abort any of the male children. If it's a son, kill him. And he's telling this to the midwives that are delivering the children that they need to be killing the children as they're born. And then, I don't know, saying like, oh, the baby came out dead or something to the mother. And that is extreme wicked. But the, the midwives feared God and they wouldn't do it. So uh, God bless them for that, of course. But see, here we see, it's just as one example of midwives being found in the Bible of, of these women that were, that were there to help through the birthing process. And I think that that is completely normal, natural to have someone there. And again, I could use ourselves as an example, my and my wife's experience. There was, with one of the births of our children, we did have a complication. There was a problem that arose after the birth. And, you know, like a lot of people want to just say, oh, I'm just going to do an unassisted birth. I don't want to have anybody there. I'm just going to do it on my own because, you know, God made it this way and I don't want to have anyone else there. You know, go ahead and do that. You can. But I'll tell you what, if you don't, if you're not at least somewhat knowledgeable in what you need to be looking out for and knowing this stuff, I don't recommend it. I don't think it's the safest thing to do. I think it, it's wise and makes sense to have somebody who has knowledge and experience there to help out. With one of our births, my wife ended up hemorrhaging 
more than she should have been. She was she had a hemorrhage and needed to have a, um, and I don't I don't know all the right terms, but it needed to be fixed. It needed to be it was a, it was a, it was a relatively simple problem. There was something that still needed to be expelled from her body, and the midwife was able to help that happen. But if the midwife wasn't there, if I was just there by myself, I wouldn't have known any better. She could have lost blood and died on her on on our bed at home, because neither one of us might have had the sense to know that this was happening and that this was a problem or even know what to do about it in order to fix it and, and, and you know pushing down on her, on her belly and able to get the to expel what needed to, be, to come out after the birth but there's a lot of things like that where someone who's experienced hey they know this they're able to to check the baby's health and look for things that are common that um, that you might not necessarily know about because you've never thought to study about it Having a midwife, I believe, is very important. I think it's very helpful to have um, somebody there to help along. I know with our most recent birth, my wife was extremely thankful that, that the midwife was there and able to help us through the process and help her, even though she's already had three. She's already experienced. She's had three other children. She said, thank you for helping me through this. She appreciated the help that she was given because by the time you have three, you're thinking like, oh, I can do this. And we did. I mean, the more, the more children we've had, the, the less of a concern it is. You know, with our first child, things were real hectic and we're like, you know, we're worried, we're nervous, we're scared. We don't know what's going on. We've never done this before. You have the child. Oh, okay, that was great. That was good. We've been through this before. The next child, you know, okay, we've done this once before. And the more you start to have, the more you start to feel comfortable because you realize, okay, we can do this. We've done this before. We've been here before. But even on the fourth, Having the midwife there to help and give some guidance and, and, and to comfort and, and to just guide her through the, the path of having a child was very important, I believe, was very helpful. There's plenty of other reasons that people can give. You know, when you're at home, if you have a home birth, you're a lot more comfortable. You're not, you're not in some, some strange place. You can actually get some good food. You don't have people telling you what to do. You know, I think in the hospital, like, they don't let women eat and they don't let them drink. And, like, all you can have is ice chips and all this other stuff. Like, you're an adult. You should be able to do what you want to do. You know, and you should be able to get energy if you have energy. If you're having a long labor, you ought to be able to, to provide some type of nutrition to your body to help your body to keep going. There's a lot of things that, that I believe um, about that. And, you know, and, and the way that the child is born, you know, the, with the woman on her back, it's easiest for the doctor delivering the baby to have it that way. But that's not necessarily the easiest way for a woman to deliver a child. So there's, there's many things, many reasons. And, you know, look into it for yourself. I'm just kind of, kind of bringing this up and preaching this. I don't want to get too far out of the Bible realm um, because this is a church and I want to preach the Word of God. But I also want to be able to be helpful in providing some information um, in case you, you have not looked into this for yourself or uh, are wondering what might be the, the best way to do things. I think getting a midwife, as the midwives in the Bible here are taught, is, uh, is the way to go. Unless, of course, there's some kind of extreme circumstance where it is, not, it is very abnormal. Now, let's turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 13. I'm going to shift gears here. That's the child birthing. Now let's go into the child rearing, the raising the children, and the proper way of doing that. Because, again, we live in a day where they're going to tell you... Um, different forms of discipline and different um, methodologies for raising your children than what the Bible teaches. They have a lot of different uh, psycho babble basically from, from people that um, really have no wisdom at all. But let's look at Proverbs chapter 13. The Bible has the answers to everything that you could possibly want to know in life. Raising children is extremely important. The way that we raise our children, I mean, it's going to impact them for the rest of their life. You have, mothers have probably the most influence in the world in general because they are the ones primarily that should be raising their children. Now, I do believe it's important for the dad to have a role in the upbringing and the dad should be the spiritual leader of the house, but the, but the, the mother is going to be the one spending the most time with the children because the father is going to be out working. The mother is going to be spending the most time raising and nurturing the children. So it's an extremely important job. Look at Proverbs 13, verse number 24. 
Proverbs 13, verse 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And don't let this escape you because the Bible is very clear on this subject of discipline. And we're going to get even, even more clear than this verse as we move, in, move on. But this says, if you spare your rod, you hate your child. And spare means you're going to hold back. Say, oh, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to discipline my son. I'm going to, I'm going to hold back. I'm going to spare the, that from him. I'm going to spare the rod. It says, but if you love him, you're going to chasten him betimes. You're going to correct him. You're going to punish him. You're going to discipline him. Now here you can say, oh, yeah, but this is just talking about discipline. It's not saying, you know, the rod is just being um, used there as, as being figurative but not real. No, I believe the, the rod is real. I believe that we ought to be spanking our children to give them the proper discipline. I believe this is what the Bible teaches. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 19. We're going to get a little bit more clear. Proverbs 19. Verse number 18. Proverbs 19, 18 reads, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So here we see in discipline being brought upon a child, and they're crying about it. Right? A little bit more evidence showing that the Bible is referring to a spanking here as a form of discipline. But also it says, Chasten thy son while there is hope. If you want your children to grow up right, you have to start early. Now, here's a general rule that we follow in our house as far as when is it the right time to start disciplining a child and start like correcting them with the rod or start giving them a spanking. I believe what, and what we do is when the child starts to get their own will and they can understand commands and they can understand you telling them what to do, and them just going like, uh-uh, and, you know, and just having their own mind, that's when you need to start applying the discipline. Obviously, like, Jonathan here, there's no, he, he, he has no clue what's going on. He has no, there's no reason to discipline a child. You don't discipline a child because they're crying, right? Because he's hungry or because his diaper needs to be changed. That's ridiculous. You discipline a child when they're doing something wrong. In order for a child to do something wrong, they need to know that what they're doing is wrong. They need to know that they're that they're they're doing something or being defiant or being rebellious. They need to know the difference and be able to respond. But that is the time when you need to start disciplining your child. They need to start from a young age knowing there's consequences for them being rebellious, for them disobeying and breaking the rules. That's why the Bible says, chasten thy son while there is hope. Because if you let it go too long, if you wait until your child becomes a teenager before you start to discipline them, there's no hope. You've already lost the battle. They've already gone their whole life not having any consequences for their actions. Once they get to a certain age, it's, it's, there's not much you're going to be able to do to correct them. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. Now we're going to get really clear about what the Bible teaches about correcting, correcting children. Proverbs 23, verse number 13. Proverbs 23. Bible says, withhold not correction from the child. What is this correction? For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I don't think you could get much clearer than that. The rod is used to beat the child. Now, we think of the word beat these days and you, and you think of like child abuse, like you're, you're beating them and just, and just inflicting all kinds of wounds on the child. That's not what this is talking about. And anyone with half a brain could realize that's not what this is talking about. A beating, you know, you hear this all the time. You, know, you get back here, I'm going to beat your butt, boy. Right? I mean, something like that. That's what the Bible is talking about. There is a, a, a specific spot on the body that God has designed and given to us that's padded. That's not going to cause any type of injury, but it also, you feel some pain. And it's the, the rear end. And that's the place that God has designed for us to receive that instruction. Because you're not going to hurt your child. You know, I don't believe in child abuse. I don't believe in injuring children. You know, and breaking bones and black eyes. That's a bunch of nonsense. You know, the point isn't to hurt your child, is in injure them. The point is to, though it is, however, 
to let them know that there is going to be a consequence and it's going to be a physical stinging pain that you're going to feel when you disobey and break the rules. And the Bible says right here, and this is extremely important, it says, Thou shalt beat him with the rod, in verse 14, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. What parent doesn't want their child to go to hell? Nobody's going to want their child to go to hell. And this is, this is where, the, where it, the gravity comes in on how important the proper discipline of a child is. He's saying, look, if you beat your child with a rod, if you give them the proper spankings, you will deliver their soul from hell. Why? Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because there is a, a fundamental truth in learning that when you break commandments, when you break the rules, there is a consequence for it. There is a very bad consequence for it, something you're going to experience and feel. The same way that with God, because with God, it's taken more on faith. You have to understand that God exists and God has rules for us and God has laws and that if you break God's laws, He has a punishment of hell for those sins. That's more abstract, but when you've grown up your whole life realizing, hey, my parents have given me rules, my parents told me not to do this, and if I do it, what happened? I got a stinging pain in my rear end. They learn and associate that this is something that happens when you do wrong and when you do bad, and it's not nearly as hard to accept the fact that there is a God, there is a Heavenly Father that is out there that has rules for us to follow and that he has a very bad punishment for us when we break those rules. This is something that, that you know, you won't think of automatically when you decide how to discipline your children, but it's written right here in black and white in the Bible. And he's saying, look, if you beat him with the rod, he's not going to die, okay? And the Bible says, spare not for their crying. Spanking my children is not a fun thing. It's not something I enjoy to do. I'll just be honest with you. I tell this to the kids all the time, look, I don't want to do this, but in a way I do just because I want them to learn right from wrong. So when they do wrong, it's, it's like, look, don't get a spanking. I don't want you to get a spanking, but if you need one, we're going to give it to you. We're not going to hold back. And, you know, sometimes the kids, they get all crazy. Oh, they start freaking out and stuff. But you don't have to worry. About, look, they're not going to die. They're going to get a spanking and it's going to be over and everything will be just fine. And it's amazing how quick the kids, they get their spanking, they cry, oh, it's the worst thing in the world. And then like five minutes later or ten minutes later, they're just back to playing again. Everything's, everything's fine. But as a parent, it could be scary. And especially as a parent who's never done this before and you start to introduce spanking, you think, well, maybe I should spank my children. And then you see it, it's like, oh, man, what am I doing? And you think, because the way that kids can cry... You could think, like, like, I've been worried, like, man, the neighbor's probably thinking we're doing something, to, you know, like, we're hanging the kids up by their toenails or something, because they could scream so loud. But it's like, that's not, you know, it's not that bad. They just get really dramatic. And it's true, it's not that bad. You, could, you, can, you can take your spanking stick or whatever, like we have, and, and I've done it to myself just to make sure I'm applying the appropriate level of pain to my children so that it's, because you, you don't want to overdo it. You want to be able to inflict what's necessary to give them the correction, but you don't want to overdo it and go crazy and, and, and everything else. But sometimes even just the bringing it out is enough for the kids to start screaming and bawl. Oh, no, 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 no. Spare not for their crying. It's necessary. It's needful. It's something that we need to do. Um, but child rearing is more than just discipline. It's much more than just that. Now, that is an important aspect, and I think there's a lot, the, the spanking has gone by the wayside these days. It's something that, oh, there's these new methods and giving kids timeouts and all this stuff. Look, it's nonsense. Just give them what they need, and, and they'll grow up to be much better for it. And I think it's, it's self-evident. When we go out places, the best majority of times, I'm not saying my kids are perfect by any means, because they're not. I mean, I got one right now that's kind of acting up in the front row but she's two years old. But by and large, we'll go out to restaurants, we'll go out places, and there's always people saying, oh, you know, your children behave so well. It's like, yeah, they better behave well. <laughs> but it's because they're used to nowadays 
families going out and, and children just running around and, and wreaking havoc and doing whatever they want to do and throwing fits, throwing themselves on the ground. Why? Because you have a parent that is unwilling to, to give them what they need. You have a parent that is afraid to give them a spanking or a parent that says, oh, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to do this. I love my children. No, you don't love them. The Bible says you hate your child if you spare the rod. You hate them. You think you love them and you don't. You're not giving them what they need. But there's more to it for training kids than just a discipline. Look at Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. We're getting a lot of wisdom from Proverbs this evening. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The Bible reads, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Verse 15 says there, the rod and reproof give wisdom. So first you've got the rod, but the reproof is the telling them that they're wrong. You have to explain what they did that's bad. It's not just the spanking. It's not just the physical punishment. You have to correct them and explain what they did was wrong and why it's wrong and what they need to do that's right to give the wisdom. But then that's not even just it. It says, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You need to spend time with your children. Not just for discipline, not just when they do things wrong, but in order for them to do things right. You need to be investing time in the child and teaching, actively teaching and training, not just letting them off to their self because they're a hassle and a burden and you have so many other things to do. If you leave a child to themselves, it's going to bring your mother to shame. Now, I believe the responsibility that God has given to teaching and training children falls upon the parents. I don't believe God has intended for parents to outsource their children's education to a public school or a private school or, or just ship them off to somebody else to teach. I think God is the one who's given you that child. God is the one who sees you to be fit to having those children. And God is the one who has left you responsible for their upbringing. Now, I'll tell you this right now. Nobody else in the world is going to have the same love, care, and attention that's going to be given to a child other than the parent. You can hire other people to do things all day long, but a hireling is just that. Someone that you hire to do something else for you, they're not going to care for it as much as if it's their own. Nobody will. You hire someone to just do regular manual work for you. Maybe you have a garden and you hire someone to do work in your garden. They're not going to take the same care that you would take in your own garden with your own stuff and, and your own tools and those types of things. They're not going to care about it. You know, just like we've got a rental house. You know, people who rent houses typically, I'm not saying every single renter is bad, but normally if it's not yours, you're not going to care as much about it because it doesn't belong to you. Why, why should you care as much about other people's stuff than your own? It's, it's natural. That's the way people are. So when you ship off your child to get, to get taught by other people, they don't have the same love and care for your child that you do. To them, it's a job. And I'm not saying every teacher is terrible or anything like that, so don't, you know, don't take this the wrong way. Because there are people that care about children that aren't their own, but it's still it's not going to add up. It's not going to be the same as your own child. If your child has an extra need, maybe, and is struggling in an area, you will spend a lot more time trying to make sure that your child is, gets through that and learns and understands, as opposed to a teacher that has a whole bunch of other kids to, to also care about and, and, and distribute her time with. I believe that it is our responsibility as parents in order to teach and to train our children. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 22. I think you're just in Proverbs 29. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. <laughs> Proverbs 22, verse number 5. The Bible reads, Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go 
and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What great words from the Bible here. Look, if you can train up your child in the way he should go, not just the way he shouldn't go by disciplining him, but in the way that he should go, train him. This is what you need to be doing. This is the way that you need to go. When he's old, he's not going to depart from it. The work and the time that you invest in the training and education and the learning that your children get from a young age, they're not going to forget it. Guaranteed, they're not going to forget it. That's the influence. You have influence on the lives of these, of these people that will one day grow up to be adults and do other things and, and hopefully live for God and live a life that's going to be pleasing to God. You have that influence on their life now that's going to impact them for the rest of their life. Use that time wisely. Understand the gravity and importance of your own job if you are training and teaching your child to train them up in the right way that they should go and don't treat it as something that's not that important. I'll tell you what, in the grand scheme of things, when you have a dirty house that needs to be cleaned and you have children that need to be taught and, and you, could, you could look at it in a proper perspective. It's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day things and the routines and let things bother you so much. I just need to get this done. I need to get this clean. Hey, if it, if it actually has to come down to a choice between what am I going to spend more time on, your children are way more valuable than a clean house is. Way more valuable. Just keep that in mind as you, as you teach and train your child the lasting impact that you're going to have. I'm not saying to keep a dirty house, but just, you know, use, use what's important to prioritize your work as, as someone who's raising children and teaching and training them. We see a good example of this. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6, but there's a good example of this, of this proverb, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, in the life story of Moses. If you remember, Moses was sent in the basket after he was born as a baby, sent down the basket in the river. His sister followed him, you know, and Pharaoh's daughter um, took him up and wanted him for his own. But then his sister said, hey, do you want me to get a nurse for you so that, you know, the baby can be fed? And of course brought him back to his parents. And they nursed him until he was weaned. So we're talking about Moses having not a very long time with his parents before he was given back over to Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we don't know how old he was. The Bible doesn't give an exact age. But he was weaned. I mean, it could have been two or three. Whatever. The first couple years of his life, though, he spent with his parents. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. By faith Moses... When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I don't think it's a coincidence that Hebrews chapter 11 mentions the role that his parents had, seeing he was a proper child, that from going from that straight to Moses refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When he was much older, his years came, he remembered somehow the teaching and where he came from even though it was a very short amount of time when he was really young. The time they spent with him was very important in what he did later in his life. Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. I preached on this this morning. Verse number 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Look at verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou. He's saying you. Directly. You shall teach them unto your children. Not unto other people's children. You shall teach these things diligently. That means, I mean, you are really focused on this and you are intent on making sure that your child is taught. You shall teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. He's talking about teaching your children all these different times. That means your children are going to be with you at all these different times. They're not going to be sent away. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. 
the words of the Lord, God's word, the importance given to that. He's saying, you know, teach it to your children. Talk about it all the time. Let them know they need to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Put it on your posts. Put it in your house. Put the words of the Lord up. Put them as frontlets between your eyes. He's saying, like, make sure God's word is always in front of you. It's always being talked about because it's so important to know this. And this is the prime, the most important thing you could ever teach your children is teach your children to love the God, to love God and, and to keep his commandments. <clears throat> More important than learning any, any other school subject. The Bible should have the preeminence. Now, I'm not, again, don't put words in my mouth. I'm not saying that none of the other subjects are important. But teaching God's word is the most important. Deuteronomy chapter 11, the last place we'll look, it's basically going to say the same thing about teaching our children. I believe it's our responsibility to do this. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse number 18. The Bible reads, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them again. And it goes on the same thing. This is so important of a command. This is so important that God is repeating himself within five chapters. This isn't just a separate account like, you know, you can read Matthew and then in the book of Mark you can see like a different account of the same story. No, this is a repeat of something that's given just five chapters later. God thinks it's that important that we need to know, that we need to teach our children, and we need to keep these commandments of God and teach them diligently. It's that important he repeats himself within five chapters of the Bible to let us know that we need to be doing this. So just to recap, child, child rearing and child birthing and the whole thing is is very important part of our life. I think this is more important than the other aspects that we talked about. I think the best way to have a child, and hopefully you see, you, you agree with me, I don't know, um, about having children is, is by having them at home and, and using a midwife. Now again, you choose a different way, that's your choice, that's fine. I'm not going to be upset or mad or talk bad about you or, or anything like that. Um, that's your choice. I do believe, though the Bible is very clear, that children are a heritage of the Lord. The Bible says that, that the Bible says the fruit of the room is his reward. I don't think we should be trying to limit rewards from God. And I don't think we should be trying to take what he does into our own hands. I believe that the Bible is very clear about that. And, um, you know, children were given to us for us to teach and to train. And we ought to be teaching them the right way and using the appropriate discipline when needed. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly